Open your Bibles, please, to the book of Daniel, chapter 4. We live in an interesting place. We live in an interesting country. We're at an interesting time in our country. I think we are, honestly, I think we're facing change. I think change is on the way. I think there's been a monopoly on how to do things like there was one previously, and I think times are changing. And I think God's people are going to see incredible days going forward. It all depends on where you're looking, eh? Isn't it? All right, so well, well done for coming to church this morning. The kingdom has advanced powerfully because you got here. You sang a few songs, brushed your teeth, did your hair. You're sitting down nicely. Some of you looking attentive. And... Uh, I'm being sarcastic, obviously, eh? Because can I tell you, arriving, coming to church, even lifting your hands, singing a few songs, is not a major achievement in the kingdom of God. It is the barest minimum expected of a Christian. Is that right? So far, none of us have done God any favors as we stand here right now. When you start to have a life that influences those around you, you're now starting to do God some favors. When your life starts to reflect what God wants to do in and through you, which came out hugely in worship this morning. Because God has a funny way of getting hold of us for purposes he doesn't always open up to us at the time. And I'm going to read to you the story of a, of a young man, uh, probably in his early, early 20s, when he comes into service in the courts of Nebuchadnezzar. This is a young man who was a prince in his own land, and suddenly he is brought into a, an environment in which he's in exile. God has judged the nation of Israel for their idolatry. They've been put into the land of exile, into Babylon, the greatest empire of its day, led by the greatest, most ruthless king of its day. And what nobody sees happening is that a little prince and a great king are going to have an altercation because God's decided it's time to get involved. In our nation, even now, there is a small church with a, with a big Nebuchadnezzar hanging around, and I want to tell you that God has decided it's time to get involved. Watch and read. I'm reading from the NIV 1984 edition. Have you got a Bible or a notebook or a phone or a something? You can follow with me. I'm going to read the whole chapter. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the peoples, nations, and men of every language who live in all the world, may you prosper greatly. Listen to the words of the greatest despot of his day. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders, his kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid as I was lying in my bed. The images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. This is quite something. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream. They could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. In inverted commas, by the way, he's called Belteshazzar off the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. Anyone know the story of Daniel so far? Is this the first time Daniel's had any dealings with Nebuchadnezzar? No, it's the second time. He already had a dream, if you remember, and he called all the wise men together and said, here's the, here's the deal. Tell me my dream and its interpretation and live. You don't tell me my dream interpretation, you die. So what is it? And we all know they were all going to die, and Daniel was used mightily by God to both tell him his dream and to interpret it. It's now some years later, the same thing has happened. God has spoken to uh, Nebuchadnezzar a second time, but this time, again, he gets all the wrong people in to give him advice, then calls in God's man. I said, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here's my dream, interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying in my bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. 
The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruits abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it all the beasts of the field found shelter. The birds of the air lived in its branches. From it every creature was fed. In my visions I saw while lying in my bed, I looked and there before me was a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree. Trim off its branches. Strip off its leaves. Scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from under its branches. But let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground in the grass of the field. Then the language changes from neuter to masculine. Let him, this tree, be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. The decision is announced by messengers, the holy ones, declare the verdict that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets them over the lowliest of men. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me, but you can because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the, so the king said, Belteshazzar, don't let the dream or its meaning alarm you. This is coming from the same guy who said last time, if you can't tell me what my dream is, I'm going to kill you. Remember, this is the same guy who after the three uh, Hebrew boys were saved in a fire. He took those guys and their families and threw them all in a lion's den. This is not a guy who is calm and rational. Is that all right? Yet he says, I'm not going to kill you. You can tell me the dream. Belteshazzar answered, my Lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw which grew large and strong with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the beast of the field and having resting places in its branches for the birds of the air. You, O king, are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky. Your dominion extends to, to distant parts of the earth. You, O king, saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live like the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. This is the interpretation O king, this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the king. You will be driven away from people. You will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what's right, your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be then that your prosperity will continue. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon that I have built as the royal residence by my might and power and for the glory of my majesty? The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven from people, will live with wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle, his nails like the claws of a bird. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back His hand or say to Him, what have you done? 
At that time, my sanity was restored. My honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out. I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now, and he has the conclusion, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right. All his ways are just and all who walk in pride he is able to humble. I have underlined those words in yellow in my Bible. And all those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. This chapter, long chapter, took me 10 minutes to read. I read for a reason. The greatest thing to stop anybody running with the purposes of God for their lives is when pride sets into our hearts, and we don't even know it's there. And we truly believe in what we're doing, how we're doing it. But God is watching. And God always, remember the old days, it was fees must fall, remember. Today it's pride must fall. God wants to take pride residence in people's hearts, and he wants to break it, because he wants to be exalted on the earth at this time. This occasion, nobody saw coming. The greatest king of the day has an encounter with the God of Israel. He'd had many, many opportunities. He'd had a dream in chapter two which was given to him And at the end of chapter two, he acknowledges God. Chapter two, verse 47. The king said to Daniel, surely your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. He acknowledges God, but he does not abandon the worship of his own gods. And we can have, you and I can know people who even now begin to acknowledge God is there, but they do not leave or abandon the worship of the gods they already have in their hearts. In chapter three, The three faithful servants are delivered from the fiery furnace. And again, Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges that there is God. Chapter 3, verse 26. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come here. Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I decree that the people of any national language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces. No God can save in this way. For the second time now, Nebuchadnezzar is impressed enough to understand that there is a God, there is a deity, but he's not impressed enough yet to repent and to serve the living God. And here in chapter four, we have a totally different setup where Nebuchadnezzar takes it on himself to write a letter to his entire kingdom and for the first time in his life acknowledge the God of heaven as his God. Most commentators are agreed that by chapter four, Nebuchadnezzar came to a revelation of God most high and got saved. He became a Christian. This event happens near the end of Nebuchadnezzar's life. His military campaigns are over. He has built one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. He's reveling, he's at ease in his palace. He's enjoying the fruits of his success. And guess what happens? God looks at his watch and says it's time. And God unexpectedly gets involved in this guy's life. And the dream is obviously about a huge tree, meaning himself and his kingdom. And what's gonna happen is the tree's gonna be cut down. The stump is gonna be preserved. There's gonna be bronze and iron put around it. Why? Because it mustn't split and rot. It must be given a chance to grow again. God has a plan. God's going to do something. Nebuchadnezzar needs an interpretation which David gives him, uh, which Daniel gives him. With great compassion and sensitivity, please hear me, with great compassion and sensitivity, Daniel sees the work of God going on in Nebuchadnezzar's life and approaches him gently and he says to him, my king, I wish this would happen to somebody else, but you need to know that there's pride in your heart and God's gonna judge it. But I want you to know that this initial judgment of God is not fatalistic. It's not as if now you're gonna die and that's the end of it. There's still a chance for you if you will repent. If you don't repent, it's gonna happen. And there's a seven times warning. I'm letting you know in advance what's going on. God has released an appointed time 
Seven times means the number of completion. God wants you to repent, O king. But if you're not going to repent, there is a perfect and appointed time set apart by God to do a work of grace in your heart. And you see, a work of grace simply means a work where God is the initiator of an action in our lives. I wonder if I could break for a moment and ask for testimonies across this room. How many of you found God when you weren't even looking for him? Because he came and found you out. He's the one who sent his son for you. Our salvation, our every effort that we produce on this earth is a work of grace that God initiates first in our lives. We don't work for God, we work with God. God initiates and God works in us and God works through us as we simply open our lives to him. Nebuchadnezzar will not open his life to him. So what does God do? God says, I'm gonna give you an appointed time where I'm gonna do a work of grace in your heart. And sometimes, friends, even when you feel you're going through a very difficult, challenging time where you don't know how you're doing, learn to receive it as a work of grace because God simply wants to bring a greater future for you than the one you have right now. God's plans are never to pull you down, shame you, embarrass you, or hurt you. God's plans are always to bring a future far better than the one you thought you could live in. And that is something of the work of grace that God wanted to do in this guy, Nebuchadnezzar. This gets fulfilled. God speaks, God warns. How many times have you had it or do you know people where God has literally spoken into their lives? The evidence is clear. God's here. God is talking. A word comes, someone grabs a microphone, brings a little word from the front, and you know that you know that you know in your heart that was a word for you. You somewhere and you know God is speaking to you. One line in a worship song. One verse in scripture and you know God's talking to you. And God brings you to the place of change and you don't make that change. That's what's happening right here. A full year later. Nebuchadnezzar procrastinates. God speaks, this word comes to the boil in my life, I don't act, what happens to that word after a while? It slowly dissipates. It slowly seems to, nothing happens, I've got nothing to fear. He probably thought the God of heaven had changed his mind, he can carry on. A full year later, he's walking in the palace grounds, boasting about what's happened, forgotten the word that God gave him, and what does he do? He speaks a prideful word, who that gets God's attention. He speaks a prideful word. God gets his attention, and in one moment, God judges him, his mind snaps. Theologians call it lycanthropy. Modern medicine and psychology have basically got rid of this thing, but it's a a condition that people used to have that, by the way, gave rise to the idea of a werewolf. Remember, when people start howling at the moon, like some of your wives, once a month, they go and they howl at the moon and they they carry on, or your mom-in-law or something, they've got lycanthropy. If something happens in your mind and you start to believe you're actually something or somebody else, it's that kind of... The word lukos means wolf anthropos man. And so it's a hectic judgment, but God has a kind word, a kind purpose, because God is gonna deal with him. And the big lesson of the day is that pride can fall. God's been speaking to him. Ever since Daniel arrived in Babylon in BC 605, God has been speaking to Nebuchadnezzar because he's an influencer of nations. And God's been whispering and God's been talking to him. But God will not be ignored any longer. Nebuchadnezzar now has to learn a lesson that millions of people still have to learn. Our God is a God who cannot and will not tolerate pride and arrogance. He actively opposes pride for the simple reason that pride fuels our need for self-sufficiency. God does not simply settle for religious tolerance. Okay, God's there in the corner. God demands the total and absolute obedience of every single human being because every single human being is created by him, for him, in his image, for his pleasure. That is what the Bible states. But Nebuchadnezzar is like all of us. God will be acknowledged or God will be satisfied. God will be happy with a little bit of acknowledgement from time to time. Surely I can just give him a bit. Christmas maybe, an anniversary maybe. I'll pop in at New Year's. Maybe even at Easter. Maybe someone's having a baby dedication. I'll pop in. Hey, put 50 bucks in. I'm here. Did you see? I'm leaving now. We don't acknowledge God is sovereign 
of all, over all. And this Nebuchadnezzar, the greatest king of the day, actually believes he is strong enough to resist the demands of God on his life, but did God prove him wrong? In one moment, everything he thought he'd build up, smashed. Which leads to a question, why does God hate pride so much? Because pride, hear me now, pride is the worst of sins. Do you know every other sin you commit is against God's law? But pride is a sin against God's sovereignty. Because pride puts ourselves in the place of his authority in our lives. I mean, in the list of things God hates in Proverbs 6 verse 16, pride, haughtiness is at the top of the list. James writes in chapter 4 verse 5, Do you think scripture says without reason? that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely, but he gives us more grace. That's why scripture says God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself to God, then resist the devil, and the devil will flee from you. Pride shut Lucifer out of heaven. Pride shut Adam and Eve out of paradise. Pride is still the sin above every other sin that keeps people from entering the kingdom of God. Why? Why is pride so bad? I want to give you a few quick reasons. Number one, pride puts self before God. Pride refuses to submit to anyone except self. It literally pits our wills against God's. Nebuchadnezzar was bad news with this. In chapter one, he goes to Daniel and his friends. And he makes them, or he wants to make them, eat the food of Babylon. Babylon. Because the enemy knew that in Daniel's life, because he was an integrous man, the only way to get at Daniel's integrity was through comfort. Offered him good food, compromise. How many of you are sold out in your relationship with God and then God starts to prosper and bless what you're doing? God provides you with things and suddenly those things provide comfort and ease and suddenly there's no place for God because I've got to enjoy what God gave me. That's what had the threat of chapter one. And in chapter two, I'll change your name. I'll give you a new identity. I'll make it wherever you go. People know you differently. They call you differently. He even said, I'll call you by the names of my gods, the three Hebrew boys. I'll even change your names. If I can't hit your comfort, I'll hit your identity. But I'll do what I can to get you stop looking at God. The amazing thing is this. No matter what Nebuchadnezzar put in the way of the Israelite people, no matter how self-concerned he was, God refused to give up on him. God refused to give up on him. When Daniel finally has the courage and tells King Nebuchadnezzar, this is the dream that's, that's been had, he absolutely refused to repent. You see, repentance is turning from sin to righteousness. It's turning from self to God. And some of us think, well, I'm a Christian. I don't need to do that. That applies to somebody else. That applies to those people stealing all our money. That applies to, actually, why don't we always start with ourselves and say, Lord, is there perhaps something in me where you have spoken clearly to me? You've put things in my life. You've, you've started to edge me towards something, and yet I'm resisting you, and I didn't realize it's because there's pride in me. Pride simply puts self instead of God. It interprets what God wants from you through the eyes of self. When I sat with the Hazyview elders yesterday, one of the comments I made to them was, sometimes it's difficult to answer God's call. Sometimes a yes to what God says can cost you. And I want to remind you this morning that sometimes that yes costs a church. Sometimes that yes costs a believer. It costs a leader. It costs a head of a home. 12 months goes by, Nebuchadnezzar won't listen. Do you, have you ever realized how easy it is to suppress the truth, to suppress our consciences when we know God is calling us to more? Pride dismisses God. Psalm 10 verse four says, in his pride, the wicked does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there's no room for God. How many times before we Christians, don't we arrogantly say, I'll only believe in God if God shows up? If God does something for me, if a miracle happens, if something amazing happens, then I'll believe in God. I've heard this so many times. Jesus said, scriptures says, signs and wonders are not enough to even reveal who God is sometimes when your heart is holding onto pride. Nebuchadnezzar threw three godly men into a blazing fire, saw God come in and join them, and he still didn't repent. 
He saw the Son of God in that fire, still didn't repent. He had all the evidence he needed, still wouldn't repent. It's our pride that needs to be dealt with. I want to ask you quickly, if God is so good and Jesus is so wonderful and everything the Bible says is so true, why don't people come immediately and give their lives to Jesus? For the simple reason that they know that when they surrender their lives to him, they've got to give up something of themselves. It's a transfer and they don't want to do it. Second thing pride does is pride takes credit. God has gifted you, but pride takes credit. I did this, I achieved, I this, I this, I that. The third thing pride does is pride is delusional. Because pride makes you believe you can control your own life. You're the captain of your soul. You're the master of your fate. Nebuchadnezzar believed that. Look where it got him. Eventually when he repented, he came up with good theology in verse 35. And he says this, he does as he pleases with all the power of heaven and the people of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Friends, pride is delusional. It makes people think that they're actually in charge of what's going on. Can I make a few very simple statements? God is the sovereign ruler of earth, not only of heaven. When heaven addresses King Nebuchadnezzar and, and binds him to, to, the, to the ground for a season, even the angel who calls to him says to him and says, King Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges his authority. Every authority is put in place by God for a time and a purpose. Every breath you draw comes straight from God. The fact that you got up this morning and you could breathe and your liver and your pancreas and your everything's working is a gift from God. Every day you live is a day lived by His grace. Everything we do is because God allows it. Man is the master of nothing. God is accountable to no one for His actions. We have begun to live and believe a believe a theology permeating the world that God is here to bless us and make us feel incredibly special. We have forgotten that he is a father <clears throat> with, <clears throat> excuse me, he is a father with lost children. And if any of you have ever been in the mall and your kid goes missing, do you remember how frantic you get when you can't find your children and you think God's sitting in heaven looking at sunrises when there are people out there who do not know him. We have a father in a sense who jealously longs for his children. He, he calls his church, his rescue mission, and he wants us to go out to a lost and a desperate world. That is the heart of the father. And when he calls us, he calls us to an action. Another thing about pride, last one, pride is earthbound. I called you Nebuchadnezzar. I've spoken to you twice, you wouldn't listen. You refuse to look up, all right, I'm gonna help you look down. And you're gonna look earthward for a season until you come right. You don't understand who you are as an immortal being and you will stand before the creator. Friends, the way people talk, the values they live by, the things they're obsessed with, show us today that almost nobody's looking up, everybody's looking down. They're looking at themselves because that's what pride does. You want to look earthward, I'll help you look earthward. I want to conclude by saying this. After all of that, the beautiful conclusion is this. The mightiest man, the most influential man in the world at that time, so, t so taken up with himself, was not beyond the opportunity for salvation. Even somebody like that could be reached with the gospel. And you know what he did? He humbled his heart. His sanity was restored. He looked up. His, he was sought out by those who had rejected him. He was put back in his position. And the Bible says he was made greater than he was before. And finally, when he finishes his words in chapter 4, he acknowledges that his whole life is a work of grace from start to finish. Even in the moments where he thought his life was his own and he was doing his own thing, he walked into revelation that God held him, God held him tight, and God was working a plan on his life. Because not only is God looking for all the lost children out there, God was looking for him. And I want to just for a moment bring this telescope to a magnifying glass. And I want to go from the glory of the heavens and I want to look at you right now. And I want to ask you the question, what's going on in your heart? 
where God has had to come in and say, I want to talk to you. I want to remind you that everything you're doing in your life is a work of grace, and I want you to see me in it. Daniel did not want to be in exile. He did not want to go to Babylon. It wasn't his plan to leave Jerusalem and Israel to head off to a place where he would be a foreigner, but it was God's plan because God wanted truth and life and light to be brought into the land of Babylon and beyond through Daniel's testimony. And you're here today on this earth, and you're living in this place, in this town, you're part of, or city, sorry, you're part of this church, because God wants you here at this time for this purpose, to reach far beyond yourself. And all he's asking is, do I have the freedom to take you where I want you to go? Are you willing to be soft enough in my hand? John 10, 27. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. In worship this morning, at the end when Rudolph was just praying and just calling out to God, I saw a most interesting picture. I saw a whole lot of old cars Classics, beautiful cars, but they were old, dusty, not in good shape, dirty in a parking lot. And there was a tub, a massive tub, metal tub, full of water and soap. And there were all these sponges. Have you ever seen an old dry sponge, how they twist like this, and they were stuck on the surface, and you couldn't even pull them, and that was this pride, they just couldn't, and those things didn't realize that the reason they were there was to be shoved into the water, to be filled up with water, to go and clean the dirty cars. And I saw God taking people willing to say, Lord, I bring you the sponge of my life. I don't even know if there's pride or not. I don't know what's going on in my heart, but I do know this. You used Daniel to change a Nebuchadnezzar, to change a nation. Is there the possibility you're gonna use me in this new season as I simply make myself available and I agree with you today that your hand will be in my life Your hand will be over my life. I will surrender who I am to you. You will take me like a dirty, old, twisted sponge. You'll rip me off that surface, even if something gets left behind. You're going to dunk me in the water, and you're going to start singing happy days. As you take me to these cars, and we start to splash and clean and bring beauty and life and light wherever we are. Your God, he opposes the pride, the proud, but all he wants to do is give grace to the humble. He literally wants to pour his grace, his ability, his anointing, and all you need is the humility to say, okay, Lord, it's not me anymore. My eyes are going heavenward, it's you. It's the request of heaven. I'm done. So, Okay, you know from last time, hey, you want to clap, but you're not sure because you know I don't dig it. (laughs) Can you feel his presence? Tonight, I get to preach again, if some of you want to come back. (laughs) Tonight's going to be a different one, but I'm giving part two to what I just shared this morning. It's a two-part thing I wanted to share with you. But I'm telling you in this room today that grace has been extended to you. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're hiding, what business you have, what your marriage looks like. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are. God knows entirely every moment. And he says, I've planned at times over your life that I can get in there and do a work of grace upon you. 
and you will stand before everybody and testify to his greatness because his hand is upon your life. So can I, can I, do, can I do two things? First thing, eyes open. If you're in this place this morning and you realize with a pride in your heart, you realize, actually, I don't even know if I have surrendered to Jesus Christ. Like Nebuchadnezzar, I might know a lot about him. I'm even in an environment where he's there. I even acknowledge his actions. It doesn't mean I have surrendered to him that I can stand up and say the God of heaven is the God of my life. I want to give you an opportunity right now. If you are not sure where you stand with God, today's a day to stand on your pride and to just stand up in your seat right now as a recognition, I want to surrender to Jesus. See, anyone like that here? I want to ask you to stand. Normally I'd say, everyone stand, close your eyes with me. Let's wait. But today, I felt differently. I felt there's a couple of people here, you've been held back. But this morning, Jesus Christ demands your all. And today, something's going to break. Because you're going to acknowledge, I'm surrendering to Him. And to Him only. If you need to do that, stand up where you're sitting, please. There's people standing up all over. There's over 15 people already. Just, I want you to just hear God on this. You may be somebody who's saying, I don't even know if I know Jesus at all. That's why I'm standing. You may be someone who's saying, I know that God has spoken something to me. I know that He demands more, but I've resisted it. But today, I'm deciding. Jesus, you get it all. Okay, now you can close your eyes. If you're one of those people who's saying, Jesus, I want to be sure of my eternity. I know that you resist the proud. I know you give grace to the humble. I know I'm going to stand before you one day anyway. But today, Lord, I want to make sure that I'm surrendered to you. Just raise your hand if that's you. I need you to raise your hand. Okay. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Hands keep going up. I'm presuming that those sixteen odd hands across this room that you saying this morning, I am surrendering all I am to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And so can I ask if, you, if we can all just stand for a moment, please? And I'm going to ask those whose hands were up, who are saying, this is my day. Today I'm surrendering properly to Jesus. Last thing I'm going to ask you to do, if you don't mind, all those 17 odd hands, just come stand here in the front quickly. I want to pray for you. Just leave your seat quickly. It's part of your act of courage this morning is to leave where you are and just come stand here in the front quickly. Okay, just come out quickly, quickly, quickly. All right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 18, 19, 20, 23, 24. Okay, I can't count. I was standing grade maths. I get it. Anyone else needs to join us quickly? There's more than 25 people here. Well, it's quite a lot of you. Okay, I just want to ask you to just pray out loud, would you? Just ignore everyone else here. Lord God, just repeat after me, please. Lord God, I come to you this morning, you alone, and I give myself to you. I declare Jesus Christ is Lord of my life, and I give everything I am to you today forever 
forgive me my sin. Welcome me into your family. And I declare, you are mine and I am yours. Jesus Christ, forever. Lord, we just pray as a church over these beautiful people who've just prayed prayers, who've just surrendered themselves to you, Lord. Today, hell lost more people. Today, Lord, lives were surrendered. Lord, today, pride was humbled. And today, Lord, there are so many sponges who've said, I'm jumping in the river. I'm jumping in that water. I'm going to get soaked, filled up with the presence of God. And I'm going to start to clean everything around me. I'm going to start to bring life and light and joy to my environment because of what God has done in my life. Lord, we thank you that he who's begun a good work in their lives will bring it to completion until the day of Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you know the hearts of every person and you hold them tight in Jesus' name. And we thank you for your work this morning in people's lives. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.